excited to have more people than I imagined. Mm -hmm. um, so my name is Emma and I designed this tiny house. And firstly I'd just like to acknowledge um, Nifty and just to say that building this was an entirely faultless process. If you're looking for a builder for a tiny house, I can honestly say there is no better. I've built a lot of structures and uh, being a you know, single yes, mom okay. and a woman, it's, uh, it's not always easy when you've got a building design in you. And Nifty just took me completely seriously, he took everything I said on board and he made, pretty much made every suggestion and every design idea he had better. So that's really unusual. He has vision, he has foresight, he is a meticulous builder. Like, if you look in here, there is no architraves, uh, no, no join seams anywhere because he's built it so perfectly. Um, so yeah. He's not paying me at all. <laughs> I prefer that I didn't. Um, so I'll just speak. I just speak from the heart, firstly, about the tiny house movement, and then I'll get into the nitty gritty. And you can ask me any details. Or I'll just lay out all the financials and all that stuff because I think that's what was in the way of me doing it. Is just knowing all the nitty gritty details of the trailer and the, and the weight, and then we can answer all those sort of really pragmatic questions. Um, but firstly, I think the way forward for humans in terms of living and in terms of having any sustainability in our, with the environment is to go tiny. Um, we can't keep using the amount of resources that we're using to build these massive houses to keep people separate in bedrooms. It's just, it's not right for me and I have quite an extreme view, so that's okay. Um, so, in terms of the environment, there are a few limitations with the tiny houses because you can't always use recycled materials because of weight. So we had to use things like pine framing, which um, you can't really get around, um, unfortunately. But there's a lot of things we could do, such as the recycled Oregon. Um, you, know, you can do what you can, but it, yeah, it's not as sustainable in terms of recycled. Um, obviously when you have tiny houses you use less. Um, you live more simply, you have less and then you have more freedom in terms of how you spend your time because you're not really you're not tied into a big um, mortgage. Um, I mean there's currently a housing crisis at the moment and I think that um, the tiny house movement provides a sustainable way forward for councils and governments and communities to create a way to empower people to live the way they need to live. Um, and I hope that, you know, I'm going to put this video up and I hope council, you know, makes some steps forward to create some land for people so they've got some, some empowerment, some agency in their life. And, you know, I've got two friends living in, a, in their car at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really hard to to be in a community, you know, like someone said, like the haves and the have-nots and feel the separation. The next point is connection. So currently research is showing that we're in a loneliness epidemic and tiny houses help create connection, um, both internally, you're in a closer living quarters with everyone, but also they create the opportunity for single people to live um, in a community and provide social connection and support and shared use of resources and shared time and collaborating with projects, but you also get your own little space to retreat to. So they're the main sort of heart issues that, that I feel strongly about in terms of advocating for the tiny house movement. Um, On to the logistics. So it, it's a $60,000 project here. Um, you're looking at $10,000 taken up in the trailer, which is a lot. Um, but Nifty came up with the idea that you can take the, the house off the trailer. So, you know, should you get to a place where you can have a permanent, um, have the house in a permanent spot, then you can reuse the trailer, sell it back, sell
sell it on to someone else, so that takes up um, a big chunk of it. Um, so I used 20,000 in my super to pay for it. I saved 10 and I used 30 out of the mortgage of my house. And so obviously I acknowledge that that's, you know, I'm in a privileged position to have a mortgage. But I'm also a single mum and I earn about under, between four and five hundred dollars a week. So it's not, you know, I'm not rich. And so I think it, it, it is achievable. Um, the cost apart from the trailer was about 50-50 in labour and material. So I guess if you have some skills and you can build it yourself, then maybe you could bring the cost down to maybe 25 just for this up part in materials. Um, just on some design points, I highly recommend um, Google Windows. They provide constant ventilation and also protection from the weather, so it's just it's worth the extra cost. They are a bit more expensive, but um, that was something I chose to put money into. Um, in terms of the design, I tried to do it so that the house would be divided by the, the big door. So this end is more the open, outside looking, outside interacting part with the kitchen. And then the other end was I wanted it to be more private and less glass and so you can have a little nook to go into. Um, there's some nice sort of design hacks inside, I guess if you want to come a little bit closer. Um, try to sort of make things have more than one use. And things like these stools pop down. And they slide in exactly in line. The three of them will stack up and then become make this um, a bigger bed, so if you've got more people, so you can constantly looking at um, other ways to use space. Um, obviously there's no bathroom inside. Uh, that's a very personal thing for me, just not wanting, I don't want a wet area inside. Um, it's got a potential for an outdoor shower and then it's just going to have an outdoor composting toilet. So um, things like that save a lot of money and, and just <coughs> allow a better, I think a better outcome for the structure. Um, I think that's pretty much all I've written down. Oh, the skillion roof. So again, um, a skillion provides a very efficient building because you've got just a very ease of use and the lack of waste of materials. I like the aesthetics. It slopes to the north. I mean, we haven't put any high windows in, but you could to get more passive light in. Um, I'd highly recommend this as an external cladding in terms of its lightweight, it's weather resistant, it's fairly fire resistant, and you don't have to paint it. Same as inside with the walls with the plywood, um, they never need to be painted. So I'm always looking for things like how do I re reduce the need to maintain this and, and ongoing um, maintenance to try and reduce it. It's completely insulated, so that's again another thing, good thing to spend money on. It's very, very sealed. Um, so that was good. So thank you. I don't really like talking, but you know sometimes you have to. And so yeah, it's just great to see such a good turnout. And you know, if there's any questions, please ask me. Don't be afraid to ask anything. I'll answer it. Many. So is the sorry is the insulation between the, the corrugated iron and the plywood? There would be yeah. Yeah. insulation and bracing as well. I yeah. think. It's bracing ply it's in some parts. It's timber, basically timber frame building yeah. with high density um, insulation in it. So it's, it's, it's gone with a 90 mil, 90 by 35 pine framing. I mean, right. carpenter who was a builder, so I don't mind. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's built kind of conventionally. Yeah. Um, 
but I've packed in as much insulation in as I've got. And I get, I, I think it's about two point one or something is the high density insulation that I yeah. can get in there. Mm. Um, so and only losing a hundred mil worth of wall space. So you could pack more yeah. in um, by putting battens and more stuff in behind the tin. Um, but yeah, we've got R two. I think R. Got to be R three and a half in the ceiling, maybe four. Right. I should know all this off the top of my head, but it was a while ago that I put the insulation in the walls, and yeah, yeah, I've got yeah. a lot in my brain. I don't always remember everything. So. And what, but I try to always get as much in as I can because it's such a little expense. Yeah. For you know, like it's you know, insulation is a real small benefit, part yeah. of a budget, yeah. and an extra few hundred bucks on really good thick insulation mm. doesn't really. And, yeah, and, and it's how worth the expense. How thick's the ply? Oh, yeah, nine mil, nine, nine mil, nine. nine mil ply, ninety mil walls. And yep. yeah, and the, and the, and the tip. So yeah. we're just very lucky to have an expert here on wastewater, which is so not my area. And <laughs> so I don't know if you just want to yeah, speak sure. really briefly. I mean, tiny houses is one um, that people get caught out with easily, which is that you still need to deal with wastewater. Mm -hmm. So officially, um, any wastewater system needs to be approved by council. So if you bring a tiny house on a property, you may get the loophole of the approval of um, being on there, but you're still meant to get um, sign off from council on it. Now that's the official. The unofficial is um, most council wouldn't know, so you wouldn't necessarily um, need to get approval. Um, I think tiny houses work well with compost systems, particularly um, freestanding compost systems. So they're like the Ecolet toilet compost, which is poo in a bucket type system. So that's inside the tiny house itself, rather than having any perforations through the floor and a, and a separate um, under the floor system. So I think that works well with a tiny house. If you're gonna be there for a long time, of course, you know, flushing or micro flush would be nice, but you can do the self, the self-contained compost systems work well. Um, gray water, you still need to think about is kitchen sullage, which has got different chemistry to laundry, which is a little bit different from shower. So don't forget, deal with your kitchen sullage. And probably the simplest for that is a nice little 70 litre grease arrester um, to take out the peas and corn and any of the oils. Uh, it'll still be fairly oily coming out, so always discharge at least 100 mil beneath the surface. So that's the, the rule of thumb with grey water is no surface discharge, but 100 mil under mulch. So you won't get caught out by council if, you, if they come and see that you're doing it under mulch. Um, banana beds are good for that, so you make a, a basin up, painted with bananas on the outside, and then discharge into that, and then any of the fronds will never go in the middle, and you're kind of going into that mass in the middle and, and feeding the bananas. So, 100 so, mil of mulch over the uh, yes. gravel or something or just... Does, it, well, mulch is because you just any vegetation you put on top. But oh, so not right. Yeah, it doesn't have to be much. No. It's, just, it's just to se create a, a human health and vermin separation so they're not you know, attracted to that. It's like a vector yeah. removal. Um, uh, and grey water, um, a common thing to do um, is to go through like a little, basically a sand filter bucket. And on top of the sand, you put um, bark chips, like pine bark chips, whatever you've got, that filters out the lint um, in the bark chips, which you replace every so often when they get a bit dirty. And then it protects the sand, it goes through the sand, and then out and again, that 100 mil um, under the surface. You can do direct discharge. But just don't forget that everything has got something inside it. So after the washing machine, it's got the lens, it's got microplastics and all the rest. So it's good to, to get that off what the floor. What about like some people grow like lamandra at the top of that? Yeah, you can do. That would be like a, like a, like a reed bed system. Yeah. yeah, I was just thinking of a simple bucket style sand filter with, okay. with bucket chip. So if you go to EcoFlow website in Queensland, they've got these little kits with the freestanding compost toilets. They've got the little grease traps and they've got these sand filter um, setups. So the treatment of yeah, yeah, it's much more greasy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you've really got three waste streams when you think about it, if you've got compost, compost, kitchen, and then the rest of the gray wood. Yeah, I mean, you can just go straight in the bucket and then pour it out, and it's pretty as simple as that. That's what most do, yeah. And so, Stroy, the three things are waste. You've got your gray water, which is your sink and yep. laundry, yep. your black water, which is your toilet. Toilet, yep. And then, what's the kitchen point? sullage? They call it, and it's some in some states it's part of grey water, and in some it's part of black water. It's an in between. It's a bit like mushrooms. Are they, you know, plant?